Greetings, people, Lead and Webs, Jake here, and welcome to another review of Rings of Power Season 2. So, this is episode 5, and this is definitely a more subdued episode compared to episode 4, which was, in my opinion, easily the worst episode of not only season 2 so far, but might have been one of the worst episodes of the entire series for a number of reasons, which I kind of delved into in that review, so if you haven't checked it out, go watch that video. So, uh, as with my typical fashion that I have started with this series, or this series of reviews anyways, I've taken notes, that way I'm less rambly. Um, so, let's just dive right into this, shall we? So we open with the Dwarvish Rings of Power, which to me look like Ring Pop candy. Um, I don't really like the, the, the design of these rings. I haven't really liked any of the designs of the Rings of Power, uh, like Three Elvish Rings, I don't really love those compared to how they were designed in the Peter Jackson movies. And even though we only got a brief, uh, brief glimpse of the Dwarvish Rings of Power, uh, I don't know, I just feel like the the jewels are way too pronounced on the, in particular, Doran's ring, which kind of makes it look like, again, a ring pot candy to me. Um, so we get this interesting shot of Doran the Third hearing whispers. So, a part of me kind of likes that, because this is kind of, I guess, how maybe the showrunners and the writers are, are kind of trying to show Sauron trying to influence the dwarves. So I think if that's the case, that's kind of cool. Um, but I'll kind of go into, like, maybe why I don't love this idea in a little bit later. Um, but yes, yeah, so as of, like, from, from that scene... So I basically just took the notes as the scenes at that particular time. Not a bad idea. And again, unlike the Elvish rings, which were not used with Sauron's influence and were somehow still corrupting people, the Dwarvish rings make a little bit more sense in why Doran and the other Dwarvish lords would maybe feel that, like, slight... like, almost like a, a tugging sensation, telling them to, like, you know, mind deeper and stuff like that. So, not, not bad. Not bad. Didn't didn't mind it overall. So, then we have the ring insta effect. Much like the elvish rings where it just insta cured everything. Uh, the dwarvish one, as soon as Durin puts it on, he's able to be like, Yep, that's the shaft we need to do to get more sunlight in here. That's the shaft for more gold. That's the one for more mithril. And, again, I feel like the, the writer's took the the abilities of the rings a little too literal um because again with like the elvish rings the whole point of those rings was to help preserve the decay of, of just you know everything like not just the their realms but just like nature and everything else and i guess they were just like oh okay well as soon as they put them on it just immediately cures everything so kind of similar to like the dwarvish ones it seems like they're just they're they're going really hard on the whole Oh, it makes them just immediately super greedy. They know just the right war veins to tap to get their, you know, their riches. So, I don't know. I just think that's kind of lame. Uh, and probably not very lore accurate. Um, or, well, I guess lore accurate in the sense that, like, that is kind of what the Elvish Rings do. They're just taken to, like, the most extreme level in this show. Um, so then after that, we get the Doors of Durin reveal. Which I think would have been a really cool scene had they actually built up to this. Because in the actual lore, Celebrimbor and Narvi, who has been featured in this show, um, were actually really good friends. And really just the elves of Erigian and the dwarves of Khazadum were, you know, they had a really good uh, friendship and uh, trade relation going on because they were next door neighbors, basically. And so in the lore, uh, you know, they developed the Ithildun, which was in episode 3, I believe... So basically like the Mithril lettering to where they glow in moonlight. And I think that's something that like they should have, again, had had this show been handled by more competent writers and more competent showrunners, that's something they should have focused on with Celebrimbor and Narvi is like their friendship instead of just this one scene where, yeah, they kind of crack a joke like they do know each other, but we've not actually seen them interact up until this scene. And again, like, I, I just feel like this... This scene was just kind of like more the key jangling, like, oh, and like member berries. It's like, oh, hey, remember the doors of uh, doors of Durin? 
and they glow. Ooh, and Celebrimbor and Nari were involved for you book readers. And yeah, so for me, it didn't really do anything because I just feel like it was it was very lazily done. Um, but I don't know, maybe that's just me having wanted that to be a, co a, a cooler scene to build up to, uh, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so then I feel like the, the banter between, after this scene, the, the banter between Sauron and Caleb Rimbor, they almost sound like a, a, uh, I don't know, like a, a, a couple where they're kind of just, they're growing tired of each other. Like, they're still trying to, like, hold it together. Like, they're not trying to, like, just, you know, blow up over the, the slightest thing. But, um, yeah, just the way that, like, the dialogue is written, they just sound like, they sound like jealous, like, or, or well, Sauron in particular sounds like the jealous boyfriend, which is kind of like, oh, Celebrimbor, you've been spending way too much time with those dwarves, and I don't like it. Not once have you taken me out shopping or proposed to give me my own ring, so I'm not a fan, and I'm just going to be all pouty. And give you the silent treatment uh so i don't know i think like they they really could have the dialogue is just really bad in this show um as a whole but that that whole interaction just to me sounded like a, a couple who were like they're on their last leg before like a big fight just breaks out and they break up um so after sauron becomes his jill uh you know starts acting like the jealous boyfriend he then says um they fear is Numenor, uh, you know, during his speech to uh, Celebrimbor why they should form the or forge the Nine Rings. So that's actually accurate because Sauron actually did legitimately feel the, uh, fear the Numenorians because they were the greatest human civilization and also one of the greatest civilizations in Middle Earth at that time. Um, now, granted, he didn't really start to fear the Numenorians as much, or at least in the lore, until basically. They just decimated him. So this is after the War of the of Sauron and the Ill. So once he's reclaimed the other uh, rings of power, so like the, the rings for the dwarves and the nine rings for men, uh, that's when the Nenorians show up. And, you know, because these Sauron's about to, like, wipe out the elves until the Numerians show up and just steamroll them. After he loses so badly, that's when he's like, oh, shit, these Numenorians, they're, they're a threat. But... I still, I still like the acknowledgement, because, again, in this weird, bizarro world of, of Middle-earth, where Sauron's actually been to Numenor and got to see its splendor, it's, I guess, in, in context, it would still make sense, potentially, why he would fear Numenor, because he's seen what a great civilization that they are. So, again, not, not terrible, not terrible, I, you know... Not not offensive, <laughs> like pretty much all of episode four. Um, so then, uh, further trying to convince Celebrimbor why they should forge the Nine Rings for Men, some deep cut name uh, drops uh, for some of the men of the First Age, such as Arendil, Tor, Baron, which the First Age is my favorite period in Tolkien's work. So for those of you who aren't familiar, you haven't read the Silmarillion, highly recommend. You'll know all those characters. Um, so, again, even though this is, like, basically another one of those moments where the writers are just kind of doing, like, name-dropping stuff, like events and people, I, I, I still don't know who this show is for, because, again, the average person who hasn't read the books or is, or is even that familiar with the books, those names mean nothing to them. Um, and, again, even though i appreciate some of these name drops of, of people and locations and events and stuff like that it's still it just i don't know it doesn't really drive the narrative forward it's more just kind of like i don't know i guess the writer is trying to, to impress us and be like see we know who tor is we know who er erendil is and baron we've read stuff maybe wikipedia articles um but moving on so Sauron's kind of deciding, like, he wants to forge, again, the Nine Rings, kind of mulling it over of, like, oh, there's got to be nine, so i got to have nine men from, like, you know, the greatest realms of Middle-earth. And Celebrimbor just immediately rejects it, uh, just kind of like, no, nah, look, I'm not, I'm not doing it. Because, um, again, the whole jealous couple thing, where he's like, you haven't, you haven't taken me out to dinner, and you're still giving me the silent treatment after uh, our last spat, so, no, nah, not going to do it. And I guess also to be fair, 
Celebrimbor is kind of given some good arguments why men shouldn't have rings of power, but, you know, he's going against Sauron. You're, you're not going to convince him. Um, so then the next scene, we see our fairs on uh, commenting that uh, the top of Middle Tarma, you can see Tol Erasea. So Tol Erasea is a small island off the coast of Valinor. Which Valinor is the Undying Lands, that's where the elves go whenever they're ready to die, basically. And that's also the realm of the gods. And, you know, basically... And I actually do like this scene, because this is... F we're, we're finally kind of getting to the crux of, like, the Numenorean... Like, why they're so resentful towards the Valar. Because basically the whole thing is the elves being the first beings, uh, uh, the first children of Eru Luvatar, uh, so the the prime supreme deity of Tolkien's universe who created everything. So the elves were his firstborn. He were, they were the first ones that he created, followed by men. And so the Numenorians, being the prideful and great civilization they are, kind of started uh, gradually started to resent the fact that elves were immortal, whereas they weren't. They, Even though the Numenorians did live several hundred years, they were still envious that, you know, the elves could just keep on trucking, no matter what. They could just keep on going. And so that's kind of what led them down, or toward their downward spiral, is that, and kind of their hubris started to get the best of them. And so I like this, him contemplating the mort mortality of Numenorians, and this is definitely foreshadowing the basically the downfall of Numenor. And so, not a bad scene. And again, I like, like, again, in the context, the references he's making to, like, Tol Erisea, Metal Tarma, that makes sense, because like, Metal Tarma is the highest peak in Numenor. And so, again, it's like there there are certain scenes, in particular in this episode, where I feel like the writing was a little bit better um, in some regards. So, there we go. Like, finally making a little bit of progress. Maybe. Um, then he kind of gives a bit of foreshadowing to Kimmon, saying that he'll meet an ill end if he um, basically fails Farzan, which, pretty ruthless, that's his own kid. Even though Kimmon didn't exist in the lore. Um, and I feel like his, his that character is completely unnecessary. Like, that, that role for this character could have easily been filled by, like, a made-up character that's maybe, like, an advisor or something like that to Far, uh, our Farazan rather than his son, but digressing. Um, now, here's a scene that I did not like. So, Muriel is talking about how... Or, sorry, Elendil is talking about how Muriel apparently opened his... or reopened his eyes to being faithful. So, uh, the, at, at this point in the Numenorean history... Um, and I'll kind of talk a little bit more about it uh, as the episode progresses. But there's two different factions. So you've got the Kingsmen, which that was kind of a name drop in the episode by Valondil. Uh, and then you've got the Faithful. So the Faithful, they're the ones who stayed faithful to the Valar. Uh, they, they didn't resent them for their short lifespans. They were totally cool with everything and still liked elves and, you know, sought friendship with them. Whereas Arpharazon and the Kingsmen were very anti-Valar and didn't want anything to do with elves or uh, really anything that wasn't Numenor. But that was dumb that he's kind of like, oh, Mario, you reopened my eyes to the faithful. No, El Elendil in the books was straight up faithful through and through. There was no confliction or anything like that. Like he was the pretty much the main, he was the spearhead of the faith, the act of the faithful. Um, and he's the whole reason why they're Numenorean descendants is because he left before Numenor is destroyed by the Valar. So I thought that's, that scene was dumb. And again, it's one, it's another one of those moments with this show where it's like for every little nugget of like lore accuracy or decent dialogue or something like that, just they just shit all over it. It's kind of like, huh, you thought that show was getting good? Nope. Uh. Uh, so in the next scene, the loyalists or the uh, faithful are being stripped of their rank. Uh, and I guess, like, again, uh, context of this show, that makes sense, because, yeah, Farazan is definitely a schemer, and, yeah, why wouldn't you want to, like, strip the rank of all the people who you're pretty sure or pretty confident, uh, or just straight up know, are, are faithful and, and, you know, loyal to the, to Tarmiriel. Um, so, makes sense. I don't get why Ayarian is so dumb and 
going against her dad because which again that's another thing too is Eorian didn't exist in the lore uh Elendil, Elendil didn't have a daughter and also I don't know why his daughter in this show like because I guess like in concept I'm not entirely opposed to like him having a daughter I just don't know why for whatever reason she's so anti faithful like maybe there's something that I've forgotten in season one that explains why she's there's the rift between the two, but I don't remember anything, and I'm not going to bother rewatching season one to to find out. But I just feel like she's being really, really dumb for really no reason at all, other than I guess she's just feeling ambitious and wants to get in bed with Kimmon and Farazhan. Um So after that, we get uh, Farazhan use the Palantir, or presumably he's using the Palantir. We don't actually see him grasp it, but he's. He's definitely inching ever so closer. And actually, a scene that I want to point up uh, that I didn't, I think it was in episode 3, when Elendil touched the Palantir. So, a couple, couple things wrong with that. So, one, uh, when he touched it, it like, I don't know, some kind of weird force field thing, like, blew him away. It's not what the Palantirs do. Two, actually, if anybody could have wielded the Palantir, it would be someone like Elendil, who's very strong of will and also his ancestry because Numenorians are the ones who've, who've created the Palantir and he's directly descended from Elros the first king of Numenor and also Elrond's brother um so just a little tidbit there that I don't know like again that was just one of those dumb scenes for dramatic effect um that they manufacture so poorly um but yeah so just wanted to throw that out there too because I, I missed that in in my last review of, I think, episodes one through three. Whatever episode that was in. Um, so then we get Gil-Galad's visions, because uh, I guess they had to add Gil-Galad in here just being that person that <laughs> apparently no one really likes or respects in this, this world, because it seems like no one actually really wants to talk to him. So, yeah. Um, during a decent squabbling again, because we got, we got some of them squabbling a few episodes ago, and they're at it again, and I don't really care. They've taken two characters that I actually did genuinely enjoy in season one, and I wouldn't say I outright dislike them, but I think their relationship was definitely one of the highlights of season one for me. Whereas now I feel like a lot of their relationship is just the two of them squabbling back and forth. So, a lot of times when they're in scenes together, I, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't enjoy it. And then the stupid Disa buys, like, this spherical stone for her daughter, drops it, and then a stupid chase scene, I guess for the sake, the, the sake of com comical relief and also contrivances. Because, so of course, it has to roll into, like, this super secret chamber that's only, like, you know, three feet deep into, like, this little side alley. Um, she does some singing, and then she finds it, but then something responds back that is definitely not the mountain and i just thought that scene was really dumb that's really all i gotta say about that so the seven dwarf lords are gathered at least that's what i thought until king duran is kind of like oh no these these are gifts for your actual lords go go fetch him so to me this doesn't make a lot of sense um so why didn't the dwarf lords of the of the seven clans all like why didn't they just come to cause a doom? I don't know why Durin sent word to just the emissaries, or why the dwarf lords would just send emissaries, because I mean, it's not like the dwarf like the seven dwarf lords like have a lot of beef. Granted some of them do live quite a bit a ways away from Cause of Doom. Like there's I believe if I remember correctly, two of the dwarf clans live in Rune, so that's a bit of a journey. So I would kind of understand, like, if those two sent emissaries, but all of them? Come on now. And again, then the scene where it's, it, it's seeming like the ring is corrupting Durin, when even though the rings kind of did work on the dwarves in the sense that, like, it did amplify, like, their, their lust for, you know, gold and jewels and riches never really became corrupted by Sauron, because that was the whole point of the rings of power, is to corrupt those he gave them to. But the dwarves, pretty much being too stubborn, 
It's like any time he tried to like, you know, use the rings to manipulate them, they just kind of brushed it off. It's kind of like, nope. It's like a, it, it with a Facebook poke when your friend pokes you. You're like, what are you doing? What was the point of this? And you ignore it. That's basically like the 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 rings uh, on the doors. Anytime Sauron tried to try to give him a poke, they just ignore him. Um, so I don't know why. Even though, again, like, the rings being corrupted, the dwarf's rings being corrupted make more sense than the elvish ones, I still just don't really like the way they're they portraying this. Even though, again, I don't hate the idea of, like, this kind of whispering. Um, I don't know, I just think that, like, they're, they're going a little too, too heavy in the whole corruption thing. And then, of course, during the fourth, who should be named the fourth? Um, should be named something else other than Durin, but that's a whole other thing. So Durin the fourth is kind of like, oh, there's a nameless evil in this mountain, and that ring, it's not helping. And then, of course, during the third, it's just kind of like, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't care, man. Um, so again, there's, one, a lot of this manufactured drama, and then two, obviously, we know what they're hinting towards. Where they're hinting towards the Balrog, because they tease that at the very end of season one, and they better not have the Balrog awaken, because... The Balrog doesn't waken until the Third Age. However, I'm I'm leaning towards that's going to happen in this show because they've brought in so many other so much so much other Third Age content that yeah you might as well because they don't care about the lore they don't respect it so yeah why not have have the Balrog awaken and destroy Cause of Doom in the Second Age thousands of years before it should. <sighs> so. Then we get Merdanya, which is uh, Celebrimbor's female elf assistant, I guess is what she is. Uh, invisible, roaming around, and then once she comes out of, um, once the ring is taken off of her, she talks about like what she saw in the un uh, Unseen World. So I like the way she described the Unseen World, because basically, for, for those of you who aren't aware, the Unseen World is what, for visual representation, what we see uh, whenever Frodo puts on the One Ring, that's that's the unseen world. Because it's kind of this. When he puts on the ring, he's not quite in the living world, but he's not quite dead either. So it's like this weird limbo in between worlds, kind of why it's called the unseen world. And there are certain elves actually. Some of the older elves are actually able to see, kind of the unseen world. So even the race, like the Nazgul. Uh, normal humans, dwarves, and probably younger elves would not be able to see them, like, if they took their cloaks off. Uh, however, I uh, don't know about Elrond, but I would say Gladriel probably could, along with Círdan, just because they're two of the oldest, or they are the two old, oldest elves. They probably could see the Nazgul, even without, like, any kind of, like, articles of clothing on them or anything like that, just because they're that old. Uh, so, again... Fun, fun little side note there, uh, or side tangent, um, but I do like the way she's describing because it does sound very much like it is in the books and what we saw in the movie. Uh, then, of course, you know, she's describing, like, what she saw, and Sauron, of course, being like, oh, she saw me, uh, but Sauron being Sauron is kind of like, oh, you know, that Celebrimbor guy, I think it might be him, I think he's touched by the devil. Um, and, of course, she's just looking into his dreamy eyes, it's kind of like, I bet you're right, dude. Um, which, again, good on Sauron. Like, I... This is more the Sauron they should have had in Season 1 and all of, like, this show is, like, this very, again, conniving, manipulative Sauron instead of, like, the loser Halbrand version where he was just getting, like, his ass kicked by orcs and Adar and... No, no, that's not Sauron. This, this is more what they should have done with Sauron from the beginning. And I don't know why they didn't, because this version of Anatar and this version of Sauron is actually not bad. Like, I actually don't mind these scenes. And actually, they are some of the better scenes in this show. Um, but, again, it's another one of those things where immediately, you know, he's, like, caressing um, Yordania's hair, and he's kind of like, oh, it's just like uh, Lady Galadriel's like, are you kidding me? Why is this man logging for Galadriel? It, it really is trying, like, I feel like they really are trying to make it seem as though he, he is actually in love with her, and when he was offering her, like, oh, you could be my queen, that was him genuinely offering her that, rather than Sauron just being deceitful. So I, I hate that. Like, my notes, Sauron looking for, uh, longing for Gladriel, ugh. Ugh. Uh, 
uh, so we get this uh, ceremony uh, in the uh, flash forward back to Numenor or flip back to Numenor. They're having this uh, ceremony to you know acknowledge the dead and all that stuff. Uh, gets interrupted by Kimmon, uh, who uh, again actually one scene that I did like about this is so the priest is speaking Adunaic. So basically Adunaic is the language of the Numenorians, and that was the language of the first men who awoke in Hildorian. And basically in the in the third age, Adunaic is basically Western. So that's what we perceive as English when we're reading the Lord of the Rings books and watching the movies. And so the faithful in Numenor, a lot of the faithful used more uh, Elvish, like Sindarin over Adunaik, whereas once the uh, Kingsmen started to kind of take hold and become the more dominant power in Numenor, they pretty much forbid all Elvish, uh, like anything, whether it be like speaking Elvish or anything related to the Elves, forbid it, and they only sp um, prohibited speaking Adunaik. And that's actually why uh, our Farazon is known as our Farazon, whereas prior to that, all the Numenorean kings would be known as like Tar, whatever. So like uh, Glad or Glad um, Tar Muriel, Muriel's father, Tar Palantir. So the Far Seeing, which is what Palantir means, um, was one of the faithful. Therefore, he had a faithful or a more Sindarin sounding name rather than Adunaik. Uh, so again, little side tangent there, um, but I appreciate the fact that they added Adunaik in there. Uh, and again, would be accurate to, again, this was clearly a temple for the faithful, so it would make sense that the priest is speaking, well, actually, now that I say that, it, it's another one of those weird things where, why was the priest speaking Adunaik when everyone else should be? It would make more sense, actually, if he was speaking Sindarin. Um, so now, I've just taken one of the few scenes that I didn't mind, and now it's kind of bothering me a little bit. And it's one of those weird things where, like, why did the elves switch from elvish and western with each other? They're they're both elves, or, you know, the, that's a group of elves. They should be all be speaking elvish together. Ugh. Anyways. Moving on. So, Kimmet gets punched, and this kind of, like, leads into a brawl. Definitely foreshadowing, like, the division in Numenor. Like, already there's kind of been, like, a bit more foreshadowing in Season 1 of, like, the division. But this season, they're definitely going... A little bit more into it um but again i feel like they kind of they should have taken their time with with the numenor storyline um rather than just be like oh yeah all of a sudden everyone is fighting each other in civil war time so uh, and then valadil gets stabbed um and everyone's super sad because you know we're sad when any character dies in this show because they all have such great character development and, you know, arcs. They all go through great arcs, so super sad, and I'll, I'll lose sleep over that. Um, anyways, next scene. Um, so, more Kelbrimbor and Sauron squabbling like an old married couple. Um, however, uh, Sauron, with his, you know, deception of like, oh, you, you know, the reason why the Dwarish rings aren't working properly is you put deception in them. So that's actually that was a that was a pretty good lie. So again, it's another one's moments where it's like, okay, people are starting to whoever's writing for Sauron right now. I feel like they kind of have a better understanding, a better grasp of what he's like or what he should be doing. Um, to where anytime even someone suspects something might be off, or anytime they're trying to like throw the blame at him, he just twists it, twists it around and throws it right back at him. So good move, good move. They're very very on point with Sauron. So then, uh, switch back over to Casa Doom, and Durin has a talk with his dad, which, and here's another thing, too, that I didn't point out in, I think it was episode one, when the Dwarvish Rings were first forged, maybe it was episode two, I don't even remember, this shows a, kind of a blur, but anywho, I don't understand why King Durin, uh, went, like, accepted the rings, because... All of season one, he was very anti-elves, anti-anything that wasn't dwarfish. And yet, all of a sudden, he's going to Regan to meet with Celebrimbor to get rings. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. But but again, there's a lot of inconsistencies with this show with their own characters. Not just, you know, inconsistencies from their book counterparts, but just inconsistencies from, like, scene to scene, season to season. Another thing that's really driving me crazy here is, again, there it's... 
it's plot first and characters second. Like, it should be the opposite. Like, the characters are driving the plot, the characters are coming first, they're driving the narrative, they're driving the for the story forward, rather than, like, well, we need character A to do this, that way plot can happen this way. It's, it's I don't like it. Um... But anyway, so like the the two Durns, they're 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 squabbling. You know, during the fourth is like, no, nah, I don't like these rings, man. Um, then during the third, hands him back his um, his collar, breastplate, whatever, um, and anoints him his son again for reasons. And Disa sees it and is like, you better not wear one of those rings. You better swear to me you won't. And he does. Which I, again, I do like the fact that during the fourth is so anti-rings and definitely know something's up with Sauron. I do like that. That's, again, one of the few decent things with this show so far. Um, so now we go to Celebrimbor scolding the Gwaithi Mirodain. So basically Gwaithi Mirodain are his, uh, like, a, a guild of craftsmen. Um, so he's scolding them and convincing them to make the nine, because he's kind of like, yep, those, those seven... We had some deceit in there, and we gotta we gotta not do that. So we're gonna build nine or forge nine now, and no deceit, no no shenanigans here. We're gonna be to the point um, again. Very much Sauron pulling the strings there, and then we get the orc arrival in Eregion, and again, no one seemed to notice a massive army marching from Mordor to Eregion. That's a good like. 600 miles or so uh and no one no one seemed to notice like they're 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 literally within eyesight of a region no elvish scouts have detected that yet when we go to uh when elrond shows up in linden i guess because he ran the whole way which still doesn't make any sense like you're using all haste yet you went by foot but anyway so elrond ran all the way back to linden in a night, apparently. Uh, he apparently knows about the, the orcish host, and it's kind of like, hey, Gilglad, we, you know, we gotta, like, go stop it. And he's kinda like, no, we're not gonna, for reasons. Uh, and again, how did Elrond get my foot to Linden so quick? Um, and then at our, uh, the last scene is uh, Gladriel being freed from her cage, um... And drawing a mysterious blade and, you know, threatening to kill Adar, but then he proposes an alliance. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. It's dumb. Um, but I will say, this is maybe the best episode so far. Not that, like, I think this episode is good. Even though there definitely were more lore-accurate moments and some slightly better, like, scenes of dialogue and stuff like that. Um, but I think, for me, the main reason why this episode is better is because it it wasn't quite as offensive to the lore and to Tolkien. Uh, so kind of by default, that makes it, like, one of the better episodes. Uh, it was still a pretty boring one, like most of the other episodes. But again, at least they got some more things right than they did wrong. Where normally it's, like, 90% wrong and maybe 10%, if I'm being generous, of, like, lore-accurate stuff that they're showing us whereas this was more maybe a little bit more balanced like again there's still uh, well even even the in the stuff that wasn't necessarily inaccurate it was still not good because this show is still bad dialogue bad writing and bad pacing but again hey you're we're we're over halfway through now and episode four is so far the best one when not a whole lot happened uh, other than Sauron being deceitful was kind of the big one of the big things in this show or this episode. Um, yeah, so that wraps up this this review. Um, I'm I, it's probably the again what makes this the best episode so far. It's the one I was least upset about, um, where I was just constantly like basically shouting at my TV of why everything's wrong. Um, definitely some moments that bother me. But I wasn't, like, offended or affronted by the all the inaccuracies, so it's still not good. But it's the best so far. <laughs> Doesn't give me much hope for the rest of the season, because we only got, like, three episodes left. So, yeah. That wraps up this review. Hopefully you all have enjoyed. 
Give your thoughts below. What would you think of this episode? Have you even bothered to watch any of Season 2? Because Season 1 was so bad. If so, I don't blame you and you're not missing anything at all. But until next time, everyone, cheers.